This is Bill Bryan. He's director of Missouri State Parks. Uh, was previously the deputy to Jay Nixon when Jay was the attorney general, and for uh, years uh, labored in the environmental division <laughs> of the attorney general's office. We like to, to brag about our state parks. We have a great state park system. Uh, there is a national award for park systems that's given every other year, and we're kind of like the Susan, Susan Lucci of state park systems. We've taken second place five times, uh, but we are going to uh, earn the National Gold Medal Award for state park system. Uh, we've got a lot of great and exciting things going on. Uh, this summer, <clears throat> in particular, is exciting for a number of reasons. It's the 20th anniversary of the Katy Trail. Uh, it seems like it was only yesterday, but it's been 20 years. Uh, so we'll have uh, a series of events all up and down the trail, beginning in Roachport on May 8th, uh, where we'll celebrate Founders Day. Uh, there'll be more information about that later, but come out and join us. Uh, we'll have the governor and many of the folks who were uh, founders of the trail all those years ago will come back to Roachport and, uh, and celebrate uh, what a great uh, asset we have for all the people of Missouri and literally people all over the world. So 20 years for the Katy Trail. Uh, we're going to have the, the true grand opening of Johnson's shut-ins this year. Uh, it's been a long time coming. It's been a struggle to get that work done. But I've got to tell you, I was down there two weeks ago, and it is unbelievable. Uh, the shut-ins are just fine. Uh, it's a, still a spectacular place, and uh, the park has been rebuilt in a new image. We're interpreting what happened uh, down there, and it'll be a, a great experience. I encourage you all to come out. Uh, probably in May, we'll have all the work done. The weather this winter has slowed us down a little bit, uh, but we'll probably have the park open for camping in April, and then when things green up a little bit, we'll have some celebrations and get folks down there uh, before Memorial Day. So, so watch for more information about that. That's uh, something we're very excited about. Um, the uh, other thing I'll mention is that we're not only state parks, we're state parks and historic sites. Uh, interesting thing, one of Missouri's favorite sons, Mark Twain, this year is the 175th anniversary of his birth, the 125th anniversary of uh, the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, and the 100th anniversary of his death, and the 50th anniversary of the shrine uh, to his uh, legacy here in Missouri. Uh, so that's uh, kind of an unusual series of events that we'll be celebrating not only in parks this year, but in historic sites. I'm excited about the opportunity to bring more people out into our state parks. One of the governor's goals is to reverse a trend that's been going on over the past six, last six, seven, eight years of declining visitation in our state parks. Everyone in this room knows the value of getting outside and enjoying the outdoors. We have a new generation where not everyone has those same experiences and those same values being passed on to them. And if we want to continue to ensure that other Missourians enjoy the same things we've enjoyed our whole lives, we've got to make sure they know what opportunities we have and how much benefit they can get from getting outside. So a large part of, of our efforts in the years to come are going to be directed at helping kids get out and play and learn that, uh, what great assets we have. So we've got to start by getting our message out to people so that they know that what we have to offer is, is something that they want to bring their families and do. When I was asked to come, I, I was uh, asked to talk about uh, some resource challenges we've got. There are a variety of challenges. Um, we're going to talk about the funding challenge, which you've already seen a little bit about. Uh, but we're also going to talk primarily about uh, some of the natural resource challenges we have in state parks and what we're doing uh, to protect and preserve the resources that we have. Uh, the mission of the Missouri State Park System uh, is a very good one. It's to preserve and interpret the best examples of Missouri's natural landscapes and cultural landmarks and provide appropriate recreation within these areas. I don't think we can improve upon this mission statement. Uh, this is... Uh, says it very well, and it's been our mission for years, and it's going to be our mission for years to come. Uh, the, uh, our parks are great places. They have great stories at our historic sites, and all we've got to do is ensure that when people get there, they have a rich and rewarding experience so that they'll want to come back and share it with their friends and family. Uh, we provide space uh, not only for our human visitors, but uh, for 85% uh, of the vertebrates uh, that we have in Missouri are found in our state park system and about 68% of the native plants are found in our, in our estate. Uh, we have uh, 85 uh, state parks and historic sites, plus the Roger Pryor Pioneer backcountry, totaling about 200,000 acres of land that we manage uh, for the, the mission that, that we've just, uh, just talked about, including 24,000 acres of wilderness, um, 23,000 acres of Missouri natural areas, 
nine outstanding state resource waters, and 67,000 acres with currently that have ecosystem management plans in place. Uh, four of our parks are regarded as nationally significant. I would argue that there are that there are five after we reopen Johnson shut-ins because what happened there has uh, has laid bare millions of years of geology and is an entirely different. Uh, experience than a visitor can have anywhere else in the in the world, mm -hmm. um, but we're recognized as having four nationally significant parks. And, per sites too. and we do have. You're right. That's right, Susan. Okay. Um, and uh, the the reason that you'll find that this focus is primarily on natural resource areas is because we're at the Sierra Club today. But she, Susan is exactly right, and she is the expert on the subject. Uh, the four of the parks are nationally significant: Pershing for its wetland complex. Big Oak Tree State Park, which we will see the, the aerial view of uh, later, which is uh, can be shocking when you see it for the first time, but it is uh, it's quite a place. That's it's the the background you see here in this uh, montage also. Ha <coughs> ha Tonka, the the savannas and, and the glades in, in in that park, and then Prairie, the the remaining uh, virgin tall grass prairie down in in uh, southwest uh, Missouri. We'll have the Prairie Jubilee in uh, this fall, and I encourage you to get down there if you haven't been there. Um, we're, we're closing the trails, uh, yet we closed the trails yesterday because we have prairie chickens booming in the park, uh, but uh, they'll reopen in, in mid-May, and uh, great place to get down, see bison, elk, uh, and just see what a real prairie is like here in Missouri, uh, even after all these years. Um, most of the parks in the system uh, preserve uh, natural areas or communities that are significant on a statewide level. That's true of most of the, of the 62 park sites that we have. Um, they're either significant because of, a, of an entire natural community or, or certain species that, uh, that are found there that are difficult to find in other areas. But it's a, it's a bastion for those uh, species and communities. And all of the parks in the system have uh, things about them that are locally important to the, the plant and animal life that's found in that area. We do present a place where they are safe, uh, that, uh, that they are, are protected from illegal plant collection and so forth, that uh, we need, of course, uh, uh, to make sure people are educated about these issues and we need to have enforcement when there are violations, uh, but nonetheless, the areas are important locally uh, throughout the state. Uh, there, are, there are essentially five things that we look for in the state park system as we're managing uh, completeness. Uh, if we lost a species at a park and it was no longer part of that community, that would be a failure. We want to have a complete picture of the natural system at that park. We want to have a rich system where our biodiversity is maintained uh, that uh, is reflective of the overall richness of Missouri's various ecosystems. Uh, that's something else we strive through throughout the system. We want to have a wholeness that the, we, we respect that uh, there are elements of nature that are no longer duplicated and that we have to take steps. As you see here, uh, fire is an element of, of, a, of a forest and how uh, and what role we play in a controlled burn is of concern to people in this room and to people uh, around the state. But it's something that we have to make room for in our management uh, to ensure that we have wholeness uh, as well as, uh, uh, as richness and naturalness. And wildness. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we have a number of wild areas where we uh, limit uh, activity uh, to an even greater extent than we do in the rest of the park system. Uh, nine parks have 11 wild areas composing almost 25,000 acres. Um, what the, uh, there is a, uh, a review process in place that is very stringent. Uh, to protect these wilderness values. Uh, a good example is many of you have, have seen the storm throw that has happened across the Ozarks uh, last, last spring and the many downed trees that are around. Uh, clearing those trees in wild areas presents a challenge because it, in some instances it may require the use of chainsaws. Can't use a chainsaw in a wild area unless I approve it. Um, and there are instances where that's going to be appropriate. Uh, but John's staff is, is going to uh, evaluate those things and give me their recommendations, and, and then I'm going to make the best judgment I can about what's best for our park system in those areas. But our wild areas uh, have teeth where we do things to protect that wilderness value. Uh, naturalness. 
we have a lot of areas that if we allowed certain activities or, uh, or development to take place that it would take away from the naturalness of the area. Uh, we don't want paved roads in, in wild areas and natural areas. Uh, the, we have to do what we can to preserve these historic uh, ecosystems and places uh, that, because they're natural today. Um, we have a, a management planning process that's been in a place and, and is very effective. Um, we have plans currently at 62 uh, facilities, and uh, they're essentially in constant review. Um, but they, uh, they are an effective tool that allows us to identify goals and objectives and identify how our strategies towards achieving those goals and objectives are doing. Um, the, uh, the goals, these goals come from a, a study that uh, was in 1992 that identified what we were trying to achieve uh, with, uh, with our management planning. Um, you can see that 77% uh, of the plans were there to inventory natural features and preserve the natural environment. Those were the objectives when those plans were prepared according to uh, the folks out at the site that did the plan. That's why they did them. That was, that was their goal 77% uh, of the time. 50% of the time, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a minute here, is uh, they were here looking at uh, the National Resource Management Goals to identify and to mitigate threats to the parks and to the values that we have in our parks. One thing that I want to improve on here is uh, the 13% of the goals were to protect our aquatic resources. Uh, we need to do better than that. We need to recognize that the activities in our parks can affect water quality and our aquatic resources. And so when we're looking at our national res natural resource management goals, we have to have a higher priority on aquatic resources. So I, I, I'm, I've made that message clear, I think, and we're, we're headed in that direction, but we're going to see an increased emphasis on, uh, on protecting our aquatic resources. Uh, the objectives uh, for, for achieving these goals, uh, you can see that a very high percentage of our objectives have to do with preserving natural communities. Uh, and that, that gets to the richness, the naturalness, the wholeness, the kind of uh, the, the bigger picture things that we're trying to achieve. Um, but preserving natural communities is, comes out highest in our, in our ranking of the objectives of natural resource management planning. Another one that kind of jumps out here that's becoming a bigger and bigger issue all the time is the need to control exotics. Uh, whether it's a feral hog or a, a, a honeysuckle, uh, there are uh, exotics everywhere in the state and they're in our parks. And if we want to have a natural environment, uh, we have to remove the exotics. We have to make space for the natural species. So that's something that is becoming increasingly more important. Uh, I mentioned fire. Fire is a controversial issue in a community when we're going to have a prescribed fire and we're, we're having fires, uh, uh, controlled burns are going very well. Uh, this is the burn season. We're out there uh, every week uh, doing, doing burns across uh, mainly the Ozarks. Um, but, uh, the, and they're going very well, fortunately, but they're very carefully planned. Uh, we work in coordination with uh, federal agencies, with local authorities, with the Department of Conservation to ensure that this is done professionally, safely, and that we achieve the natural resource management objectives that we have for the park uh, while not endangering uh, neighbors, uh, because that is a, a legitimate concern. Uh, folks don't want us out there throwing a match and walking away, and we don't do that. We do it professionally. Uh, we have some native, uh, native animals that have been reintroduced uh, to, uh, to help. Uh, this is Prairie State Park. Uh, where you know, we have a limited reintroduction of, uh, of the North American uh, Roosevelt elk and uh, the bison, and this is done uh, because they belong on the prairie. And so their native grazing will help us maintain uh, the prairie ecosystem uh, just by virtue of the fact that they exist there and that they're living. Uh, exotic species. Uh, the feral hog is a very real problem. Um, we have uh, trapped over 200 feral hogs at Johnson shut-ins. Uh, they're uh, in several of our parks. Uh, they're in areas that are very near to several of our parks, and they are a real threat. They can destroy acres overnight, uh, and they're not native to, uh, to the park. Uh, yeah, they, they disturb the, the soil and, uh, uh, and uh, don't, uh, don't do anything good for the park uh, from a, either a 
natural resource perspective or from a beautification or maintenance perspective, either one. They're very secretive and, and uh, you will know they've been there not because you've seen them, but because you've seen where they've been. Um, if you're out in the, in the woods and you come across an area that is, uh, as, as Ken mentioned, it looks like it's been tilled for a garden, when you get back uh, off the trail, let the, let the park, park office know because we'll want to know that there was activity in the area you were at um, uh, so that we can uh, see if we can uh, scare the animals out of the park or remove them from the park. Do they cause any threat to anyone, uh, like the Razorbacks? They, they, uh, they possibly do. Some of them are Razorbacks. Uh, they, the, the wild hogs will uh, go through two to three generations in a year, uh, so they go from being a domestic hog that's escaped uh, to a wild hog very quickly uh, within a year. And the, uh, there are numerous uh, Russian boars that have been released in the state for hunting purposes. And those animals have uh, not been successfully hunted, and so they are, they're out there today. Um, there are, uh, I suppose they, put, they pose some risk to visitors, but we've never had any problems because they are very secretive animals. They don't want to be around us any more than we want to be around them. Uh, but I, I certainly would go the other way if you saw one on the trail. You know, I, I wouldn't... Uh, I want my picture taken with it. Uh, and that's a good note to turn to, uh, to our threats. Um, the, uh, the picture right here, I'll point it out. This, Ken mentioned Big Oak Tree State Park. This is Big Oak Tree State Park. Um, many uh, world champion trees in the park down in southeast Missouri. It is uh, surrounded by uh, farmland. Uh, the, uh, the unique feature in the center of the eyeball was uh, man-made to drain water off the farmlands many, many years ago. And it was somewhat successful. Now there is uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, farming practices and water control practices around the park that divert water away from the eyeball and away from the park so that the, uh, the natural ecosystem is degrading every day because it is, it's meant to have water on these trees at certain times of the year and it's no longer guaranteed that we'll have that because the water drains differently than it did as a, as a natural matter. It's only about, a, a, about two miles off of the Mississippi River and we've been working with the Corps of Engineers to develop a project that would help the park where the Corps would help deliver water from the Mississippi River to the park uh, to restore that natural hydrology. Uh, but that is, an, if you've never been to Big Oak Tree State Park, it's a long way from Columbia, but it's worth going because it is an interesting place. And, and seeing the, what you can't appreciate from this photo is that those are really big trees. It really is Big Oak Tree State Park. And when you, you see this island from miles away as you approach it, it's, uh, it's worth going. Great bird watching spot. Uh, really an interesting spot to spend a day or two. Um, but there are, there are many different uh, threats. Uh, we've talked about uh, exotic species, um, changes in hydrology, and, and isolation. Um, this, this, this is essentially an island that will the animals that belong there be able to continue to survive there on that island? It's just like uh, an island in the middle of the ocean. You know, can you swim from this island to the next island? We've done some work with the Department of Conservation to try and build some habitat corridors, and we're close. We're close to connecting the park through wildlife corridors to other places, but it's not quite there yet. But we're close. We're getting close. Um, but there are a lot of threats uh, to our parks that are, that are worth mentioning. In 1992, the study of uh, threats uh, to, to our state parks that the division undertook came out this way. The number one threat to state parks in 1992 was soil erosion. We've come a long way there. I'll show you what our current threats are in, in a minute. But that was our number one threat back in 92. Um, exotic plants, 48. We didn't even see exotic animals. Feral hogs weren't really on the radar screen in 1992. But they've come on in a big way in the last 10 years. Um, land development, uh, sewage runoff was, was just barely made the list. It's a, a continuing problem we've got to deal with. But this gives you an idea of what some of the things are that, uh, that we're dealing with to uh, to, uh, to protect our parks, some of the threats that we faced in 1992. And I'll, when you see this, you'll see that many of them are still threats today. Um, exotics is now the number one threat to our state parks based on our, our uh, State Parks Academy uh, research that was done last year. 
Um, and this is, all, this is all Missouri information based on polling our own Missouri Natural Resource Managers through the, uh, uh, the Jaeger Academy at the Missouri Division of State Parks. Uh, natural processes has what uh, Ken McCarty is our state's uh, chief naturalist. Some of you may know Ken. What Ken is getting at when he talks about natural processes is simply changes in, let's take for example a stream. If there's been channelization in a stream, um, it may affect uh, a mussel species because they're displaced. Uh, that would be an impairment of the natural processes that would ordinarily go on in that stream. And you can take that to anything else. It would impair the, another uh, kind of a, an extreme example would be if we uh, um, put a parking lot in a fen. That would certainly uh, disrupt the natural processes of the fen. So we, when we take on projects, we try very hard working with the natural resources section uh, and the construction crews to make sure that we're successful and that we don't impair those natural processes. A good example is at Ozark Caverns uh, this uh, past year, uh, it was, this was one of our award winners, it won a Missouri Masterpiece Award this year from, uh, from the division, uh, was a project to build a new parking lot for Ozark Caverns because they had a gravel parking lot that was, there was runoff and there were issues with it. But we had a fen nearby and some very significant biological communities through great teamwork with the naturalist staff and the construction crews, we were able to complete that project with no impact and without impairing the footprint of this significant resource. So it is a matter of having all the tools and the right people working together. And, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that we have a lot of great folks that know what they're doing and that work together really well so that we're able to, to accomplish that objective. Uh, but there are things that are beyond our control that can impair uh, natural processes as well. Um, it's hard to decide. I've been Im impressed in the short time I've been here, I just uh, started uh, this uh, October, uh, that how challenging it is to make the right choice. An example uh, is uh, Rockbridge State Park, right here in your backyard. We've got uh, wild cave tours every spring and, f and fall. Some of you may have been on those. Uh, if, you, if you haven't been on them before and you may be thinking, gee, I'd like to do that, you better do it in a hurry. This season, I, I made the decision that we're cutting the, a number of wild cave tours in half because we are impinging on uh, the formation of an endangered species, uh, gray bat maternity colony, in, in the devil's icebox. And we're going to cut the, the cave tours this spring uh, in half uh, to, and we'll, we'll see, we'll evaluate next year whether we've had that same impact on the maternity colonies. And if we have, then we're going to be faced with the decision of can we do the tours in the spring? Because if we're impacting an endangered species that's, that's trying to use the cave to raise their young, we got to do something else. There are a lot of folks, they enjoy uh, a recreation that may be different from what we enjoy, but our parks are for all Missourians. And that's why we have some activities in our parks that aren't popular with everybody here. But some Missourian who pays their taxes wants to ride horses, uh, wants to ride ATVs, and uh, wants to go fishing on opening day. And so we try to pro provide an appropriate time and place for all of that recreation and try to minimize the, uh, the impacts that we have between different, different uses. Uh, the, and you'll see down here in the corner I've added funding. Uh, that is uh, something that uh, the MPA slideshow touched on, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, letting you know where we're at. 76% uh, of our state parks budget comes from the uh, one half of one tenth of a cent parks and soils sales tax. Uh, people have come together, people in this room have led that effort to get that on the ballot and approved and uh, we have a 70, Susan, is it 77% approved it last time out? That's about right, about 75% 71. 71. 71% of Missouri voters approved it last time out, strong majority, people that support parks and, uh, and uh, preventing soil erosion. Uh, but that's 76% of our spending. Essentially, we get a little bit of federal money through the Land and Water Conservation Fund that we then pass through to communities to do work on, on parks and trails around the state uh, and, uh, and a few other federal sources. We have two parks that have an endowment at Merrimack and Onondaga and then at, the, at Babbler State Park near St. Louis. Uh, very small endowments, but there's some funding there. 19% is earnings. That's money that we generate through the activities and the services that we provide. 
through concessions, through camping, through selling T-shirts, selling food and ice and firewood, uh, money that we earn from running parks. Uh, that's what our budget is made up about. So if 76% of our budget comes from one source, whether you're the state parks or a small business or a family, if you get 76 of your income from one source and something happens that has a dramatic impact on that source, you're going to feel the pain. This next slide, though, will, will kind of get to what you're, you're looking at. This shows you what our sales tax revenue has been like. Um, you can see that in uh, 2007, um, our sales tax started to go down a little bit. Um, there's some theories about why that is. We've, there's one, in, one indication is we think of internet sales has, had a, has made a dent in this. Um, but otherwise, I don't, I don't know. Then you can see very clearly the impact of the recession in 09 and, and, and 10, where we've essentially gone back to the level of income that we got from the sales tax in 2003. Are you paying more for gas and heating and food? today than you were in 2003? Our expenses are higher too to run the state parks. So while our revenue has gone like this, our costs have steadily climbed over, over the past several years. So we're now in a position where the revenue that we have to fund 76% of our budget is inadequate. So we have to make changes in the way that we operate and we have to uh, find new sources of revenue. 36 million is how much money we expect to get this year through the sales tax to run our state parks. Um, that figures out to be about $6 per citizen. That's a pretty good deal. For the cost of one you know, meal at McDonald's, people support our state parks. And I talked earlier about the need to get kids off the couch and get them back outdoors. Uh, two initiatives uh, that are going on right now uh, is uh, our state parks youth corps. Uh, we're going to hire 1,000 young people uh, to come to work uh, this uh, summer in our state parks. Uh, the, the, this, will be, this will use stimulus money under the Recovery Act that's dedicated to uh, workforce investment that will get kids out there from, 18, from 17 to 24 uh, to uh, learn new skills, learn about our parks, and do much needed projects that we wouldn't get to do otherwise. Um, 1,000 kids, if you know somebody who's interested, go to mo.gov. And on the state homepage, there's a tab to click on to fill out the online application. Um, get out and play in Missouri State Parks is our initiative to help get uh, kids and families back outdoors so that we can uh, uh, change the decline in attendance at our state parks. I'm pleased to report that this year uh, we have an increase in attendance uh, for the first time in several years. So that's a good thing. It's a, it's a start, uh, but we have to sustain it. So two weeks ago, uh, Governor Nixon signed uh, the Children in Nature Executive Order uh, directing the Departments of Conservation and Natural Resources, Health and Mental Health, and Social Services to work together and, uh, and develop plans to help essentially get kids out and uh, help make them happier and healthier. In a recent survey by the Missouri Parks and Recreation Association, 95% of Missourians said that they felt like spending time outdoors led to a happier and healthier life. So if Missourians believe that, how can we miss? We just have to get the word out there. We have to provide the opportunities. And when people accept those opportunities, we have to ensure that they have a rewarding experience.